Welcome, everybody. My name is Mina Jane, and I am with uh, the director of the Ashland Public Library, and I'm so thrilled to be here with Gerald Walker, uh, who will be talking about his book, How to Make a Slave and Other Stories, in just a couple minutes once I do all of the housekeeping stuff. Um, I know that there are people here from all over the state. We're so excited to have you, and um, we'll be having an amazing conversation, I'm sure. So um, just like I said, a few sort of um, housekeeping things. I wanted to let you know that we are really happy to be uh, collaborating with the libraries in Brookline, Newton, Tewksbury, and Watertown for this program, and I believe Waltham too. Um, when I when libraries get together to do programming like this, it's really magical. I think um, we are also partnering with the State Library of Massachusetts for this program, and they have been unbelievably excited about Gerald talking with us tonight and have done an amazing job of communicating to Massachusetts residents about this wonderful program. So thank you. Um, locally, I'd like to thank the Friends of the Ashland Public Library and area, our Ashland's Residents for Equity and Action, who have helped and supported us in these programming. Um, we are going to take questions from the, our audience after Gerald's presentation. You are welcome to put questions in the Q&A and use, please use the chat for any comments or tech issues, which I will be paying attention to. Um, so you can get Gerald's book um, at the library or at Newtonville Books for this program. I'll put links to that in the chat as well. And, um, you know, having your own books, whether from the library or from the from where from the bookstore is amazing. So without further ado, Gerald Walker, he along with two memoirs, Gerald is the author of How to Make a Slave and Other Essays, which we are talking about today, a finalist for the 2020 National Book Award and winner of the 2020 Massachusetts Book Award. His work has appeared in publications such as the Harvard Review, the Iowa Review, and Mother Jones, and has been widely anthologized, including five times in the Best American Essay series. He's a recipient of, Na of National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship and a Pushcart Prize. Gerald is a professor of creative writing at Emerson College right in our backyard. So exciting. So Gerald, please tell us all about this wonderful book that I have been raving about to everybody I know. Thank you so much, Mina, for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. Yes, I will talk about this book, but let me begin um, with a story about James Baldwin. Uh, James Baldwin once was asked uh, by an interviewer about how he came to be a writer, and he wondered um, if it made sense for him to be one. In fact, the question to Baldwin was, you were born poor, black, and gay. Don't you think that puts you at a disadvantage to being a writer? And Baldwin said, disadvantage? Why, I feel like I won the lottery. Well, I was born poor, black, to blind parents and raised in a doomsday cult. So I feel like I won the mega millions. My background has been pretty wacky and I've managed to mine my experiences for three books. I'm halfway done with the fourth. And I thought before I talk a whole lot about how to make a slave, I would give some context to how the book uh, came to be and why I dedicated it the way I dedicated it. Um, my second book was a memoir, uh, and its title is The World in Flames, and it's a, boy, a boyhood raised in a white supremacist doomsday cult. Um, the person who founded this cult was named Herbert W. Armstrong. He founded the cult in 1934. He was a racist and a segregationist, and he preached that the world would end in 1975. In 1972, everyone who was called to the faith of this religion would be whisked away to a place of safety where they would hide out for three years while the world was engulfed in uh, drought and, and fires and uh, plagues and wars. And all of this would happen. And in 1975, it would culminate with the return of Jesus and uh, we would start anew. All of us who had been in hiding for three years would be at the top of the line in God's favor. Um, that was kind of wacky, but my parents believed it. 
Uh, I believed it. I was raised in it. And the thing about um, religious cults, doomsday cults, is that when you set a date, uh, it needs to be correct. And in the history of the world, no doomsday cult has been correct yet. And so in 1972, uh, nothing happened. In 1975, nothing happened. In 1978, something did happen, and that was 60 Minutes did an expose on the religion and discovered that the founder, Herbert W. Armstrong, was in fact a crook, and he had been embezzling money from the church to live this extraordinarily lavish lifestyle. And so we were devastated by it, and people started leaving the church in droves. But you might be wondering, why would a Black family join a white supremacist doomsday cult? And that's a good question. Uh, I can't answer for the hundreds of other Blacks who joined it, but I can tell you why my parents did. Uh, as I mentioned, my parents were blind. My mom lost her sight when she was nine. My dad lost his sight when he was 12. And one of the things that they were told when they joined the church is that everybody with a physical disability would have it eradicated. So my parents in 1972, as we were about to flee to the place of safety, would have their eyesight restored. And for two people who had seven children, who had never seen their faces, never seen them smile, never seen uh, anything about their children, the thought that you would see one day in a few short years is pretty powerful incentive. And so they were devastated when none of these prophecies came to be. But my parents had a backup plan, just in case, just in case the religion didn't pan out. Uh, they wanted to make sure that their children had the best opportunity to succeed in the secular world. And so in 1970, two years before we were supposed to flee to the place of safety, they actually fled from the housing projects in Chicago where we were living to a white community on the south side of Chicago. Because this community had very good schools, it had very little crime, and they wanted us to have the advantage of um, the privileges embedded in that community if things didn't work out with the church. And so um, there we were in this community on the south side of Chicago, uh, in 1978, after the 60 Minutes did their expose and we discovered that the church was um, a fraud, uh, this white neighborhood that we moved to in 1970 had by 1978 become all black. We were the second black family to move into that neighborhood. In eight short years, we were uh, a complete absolute ghetto like the one that we fled. Because when whites fled to the suburbs, uh, they also took their businesses and mom and pop shops and all the other things that supported the economic base of the community. And so um, while my parents had fled a neighborhood that was uh, pretty difficult to raise a family in to give us a better life, we found ourselves right back where we were in a sense. Now imagine, you are um, 14 years old, as I was in 1978. The church that you were raised in for your entire life has been discovered to be false. Everything that you believed about everything has been ripped from you. And so in a sense, you are kind of empty. Something needs to fill that void. And unfortunately for... Uh, me, what filled the void was the fact that the neighborhood was full of vices. There were drugs, there were gangs, there was petty crime, there was all these things. And for someone who has been so devastated by the failure of their religious base and support, um, it is not unreasonable that they would find themselves sort of swept up in this criminal element.
And that is exactly what happened to me when I was 14. So my second, well, my first book um, covers this material from the ages of 14 to about 40. Uh, it's called Street Shadows. And it's all about me being this juvenile delinquent and trying to find his way after the devastating letdown of this church. Now, um, I was no good at being a uh, street thug or petty criminal or any of those things. I tried it, but I simply, not everybody is cut out for a certain uh, inner city lifestyle. And so uh, I found myself needing to make a decision um, and to extract myself from that community because it was getting pretty dangerous um, by the time I was 18 or 19 years old. And so I moved out of that community, but I brought with me some of the bad habits that I had picked up. And one of them was an affection for cocaine. I love that stuff, couldn't get enough of it. Although I had to because I didn't have a lot of money. By the time I was 18 years old, I was working full time at a medical center, cleaning human waste from test tubes. That was my job. Not a great job, but it paid the bills and it allowed me to get high every now and then. So that was great. Um, one day when I was um, 22 years old, still in this dead end job, uh, I had no prospects of a better future, uh, but I did have um, a habit that needed to be addressed. Uh, a friend of mine when I was 22 called me and asked me if I would like some Coke. And I said, absolutely, but I don't have any money. I'm, I'm broke. And he said, not a problem. Just come on by. I'll give it to you on credit. Pay me later. And I said, awesome. So I went to his neighborhood. It was late at night, 10, 11 o'clock. I went through a dark alley to go to his third floor apartment. And when I stepped into the alley, someone came out of the shadows and put a gun to the side of my head. And the man said, give me your money. And I said, you, you picked the wrong guy. I have no money whatsoever. Uh, I'm here to get some dope from my friend on credit. The man searched my pockets just to make sure, discovered it was true, I had no money, and told me to go upstairs, go where I was going. And so I went upstairs. My friend Greg um, answered the door. I told him what happened. A guy just tried to rob me. We both laughed about it because that was such a common thing. It was not a big deal. And he proceeded to give me the drugs. Um, and I left and I went to my apartment and I started getting high. 30 minutes later, I received a phone call from one of my brothers who asked, did you hear what happened to Greg? And I said, well, what do you mean? I, I just saw him. I was with him a few minutes ago. He said, well, he's dead. And I said, what do, you, what do you mean he's dead? And my brother said he was found at the bottom of the stairs in the alley to his apartment, shot six times in his head. And it occurred to me that the man who had put the gun to my head and did not pull the trigger had put the gun to Greg's head and pulled the trigger six times. That the body at the bottom of those stairs, my friend was supposed to be me. And in a way it was, because as of that night, I decided that I was done with all elements of that culture and that environment, including drugs. I took the remaining Coke I had, I dumped it out the window. I have not gotten high since. But there I was, still a 22-year-old who was spending his life cleaning test tubes. I knew what not to do with myself, but I didn't know yet what to do with myself. But every day I rode the L train to my job and the stop before the medical center where I got off the stop before that was the University of Illinois at Chicago. And every day when we pulled into that station, I would watch these kids, kids meaning 22, 23, my age at the time, I would watch them rise, put their backpacks over their shoulder and walk out the door. 
And I watched him through the window go across the highway and go to the university campus. And then the train would pull away and I would go to my miserable job. This happened every day. One day I surprised myself. When the doors opened and these students rose, I rose with them. And I walked out with them, crossed the highway with them. We got to the campus and that's where I stopped. I lost my nerve. And I went back to the train and I went back to my job. The next day I did it again, but I went a little bit further. And this part of the story is especially relevant to tonight's talk because what happened next shows the value of public libraries and how they can in fact save a life because they saved mine. On the second day that I went with those students to the campus, I followed someone into a building which turned out to be the school library. And I took a book, I sat at one of the tables and I pretended to read it. I did it waiting for someone to tap my shoulder and say, you don't belong in here, get, get out. Never happened. The next day I went back, I did the same thing. I stayed a little bit longer. The next day I did it again and I did it again day after day after day, until I got really comfortable with the thought of me being at an academic institution in a library. I even went to the school bookstore and bought a sweater that said UIC Flames, and I bought a backpack with the school's logo as well. And I filled it with a bunch of books and I went to the library until I convinced myself that I should be here, that this is a place that I have every right to be. And so I contacted the admissions counselor and scheduled a meeting. And I went to see him and I explained that I was a high school dropout, that I had failed pretty much all of my classes for every minute I was in school, that I didn't have a lot of money. And um, nevertheless, I thought I would like to be a college student at this institution. And I remember he shook his head sadly and said, son, you'll never be accepted here. And I will not forget how when I rose from his chair and walked from the room, I wasn't sad or disappointed because I had discovered that there had to be a place like this for someone like me. That place turned out to be a community college, because community colleges like public libraries accept everyone. All are welcome, even high school dropouts. And so I took courses for a couple of semesters. I failed them all, but I was there and I was trying. I simply didn't know what I wanted to do with myself and nothing really grabbed my interest until one day I randomly took a creative writing class. And the professor, a man by the name of Edward Homewood, said to me after reading one of my short stories, you ought to be at the Writer's Workshop at the University of Iowa. And I had not heard of the Writer's Workshop. I had barely heard of Iowa. But he told me, if you let me work with you for two years until you finish your associate's degree, I'm gonna take you out to Iowa, you're gonna transfer, and that's where you're gonna finish your BA. And I said, sure, why not? And so for two years, I worked closely with him. And after I finished my associate's degree, he rented a car one day and drove me to Iowa City so I could see the campus. He even took me to the writer's workshop and put his hands on my shoulders and marched me into the room and said, everyone, this is Jerry Walker, mark my words, you'll hear from him someday. And they all thought he was nuts. I did too. We left the writer's workshop, toured the campus. I stopped by the, uh, the admissions office and got the brochures. And as we were driving back to Chicago uh, and I was thumbing through the brochures, Professor Homewood noticed that my mood changed. And he asked me, what's, what's wrong? And I told him, I just saw the tuition. I can't pay this. I can't go here. And Professor Homewood said, you don't worry about the tuition. I will pay it for you. I didn't believe him but it was true. 
And so I quit my horrible job. I moved to Iowa City and Professor Homewood, true to his word, paid my tuition out of pocket. A community college professor who did not make a lot of money. He couldn't even afford a car, which is why he had to rent one. But he paid my tuition. And when I completed my BA, having applied to the writer's workshop and by some miracle, I was accepted. I didn't call my parents. I didn't call my friends. The first person I called was Professor Homewood to thank him for the life that he had given me. I talk about Professor Homewood at length in my book, Street Shadows. And one of the things that I would like to say about something people say about memoirists, that we're navel gazers, that we're narcissists, that all we wanna do is to talk about ourselves. And I am here to tell you that that is not true. If you believe what I believe about the role of a memoirist, the role of a memoirist is not to talk about yourself and celebrate what you've achieved, but to sing the praises of the people who got you to where you were. Professor Homewood is one of those people. Another one of those people is a man by the name of James Allen McPherson. James McPherson is the person to whom I dedicated How to Make a Slave to. I'm gonna read um, an essay in it and um, it is about McPherson, and when I finish, you will see why he meant so much to me and how he came to shape the contents of this book and my worldview of writing and my philosophy of what my role as an artist should be. The title of this essay is Dragon Slayers. I was at a Christmas party with the man who wanted me to hate him. I should hate all whites, he felt, for what they have done to me. I thought hard about what whites have done to me. I was 40, old enough to have accumulated a few unpleasant racial encounters, but nothing of any lasting significance came to mind. The man was astonished at this response. How about slavery? He asked. I explained, as politely as I could, that I had not been a slave. But you feel its effects, he snapped. Racism, discrimination, and prejudice will always be a problem for you in this country. White people, he insisted, are your oppressors. I glanced around the room just as one of my oppressors happened by. She was holding a tray of canapes. She offered me one. I asked the man if, as a form of reparations, I should take two. It was midway through my third year in academia. I had survived mountains of papers, apathetic students, cantankerous colleagues, boring meetings, sleep deprivation, and two stalkers. And now I was up against a man who had been mysteriously transported from 1962. He even looked the part with lavish sideburns and solid black rimmed glasses. He wasn't an academic, but rather the spouse of one. In fact, he had no job at all, a dual act of defiance he felt against a patriarchal and capitalistic society. He was a fun person to talk with, especially if, like me, you enjoyed driving white liberals up the wall. And the surest way to do that, if you were black, was to deny them the chance to pity you. He'd spotted me 30 minutes earlier while I stood alone at the dining room table grazing on various appetizers. My wife, Brenda, had drifted off somewhere and the room buzzed with pockets of conversation and laughter. The man joined me. I accepted his offer of a gin and tonic. We talked local politics for a moment before moving on to the Patriots, our kids, and finally, my classes. He was particularly interested in my African-American literature course. Do you have any black students? He inquired. We started with two, I said, but ended with 28. I let his puzzled expression linger until I'd eaten a stuffed mushroom. Everyone who takes the course has to agree to be black, I said, for the duration of the semester. Really, he asked, laughing. What do they do, smear their faces with burnt cork? Not a bad idea, I said, but for now they simply have to think like blacks but in a way different from what they probably expect. 
I told him that black literature is often approached as records of oppression, but that my students don't focus on white cruelty, but rather its flip side, black courage. After all, I continued, slaves and their immediate descendants were by and large heroic, not pathetic, or I wouldn't be standing here. The man was outraged. You're letting whites off the hook, he said. You're absolving them of responsibility, of the obligation to atone for past and present wrongs. He went on in his vein for a good while, and I am pleased to say that I goaded him until he stormed across the room and stood with his wife, who, after he'd spoken with her, glanced in my direction to see, no doubt, a traitor to the Black race. That was unfortunate. I'd like to think I betray whites too. More precisely, it's the belief that Blacks are primarily victims that I betray, a common view held by both races. I too held it for many years. When I was in my early 20s and making my first crude attempts at writing fiction, I'd sit at my word processor and pound out stories brimming with Blacks who understood only anger and pain. My settings were always ghettos because that was what I knew. And the plot centered on hardship and suffering because I knew that too. And I also knew this. White society was responsible for the existence of this miserable world. And it was my duty as a black artist to make this clear. Three of these stories gained me acceptance into the Iowa Writers Workshop. It was there that my awakening occurred. My first course was with Frank Conroy, the program's director. He was brutally honest and harbored a militant obsession with clarity. Most of the two hour long classes were spent with him shredding the stories and our egos. We squirmed in our seats and wiped our brows as he did his infamous line by line, zeroing in on words and phrases that confused the work's meaning or failed to make unequivocal sense. It was the most intense and best writing class I'd ever had. I went into the second semester confident that my prose had improved and that the most difficult course was behind me. Randomly, I decided to take a workshop with James Allen McPherson. During the break before classes, I read his books for the first time. The impact his writing had on me was profound. He too chronicled the lives of African-Americans and he had done it in short story form, my genre of choice at the time. This was the motto I'd been searching for. I read the stories over and over again, convinced that I had found my literary father. The contrast between Conroy and McPherson could not have been more stark. Conroy was tall, white and boisterous. McPherson was short, black and shy. Conroy cursed, yelled, and laughed. McPherson rarely spoke at all, and when he did, his voice was so quiet you often couldn't hear him. The students dominated his workshops. I was disappointed. McPherson was a Pulitzer Prize winner, after all, the first African American to receive that honor for fiction. He was the recipient of a MacArthur Genius Grant, as well as countless other awards. I wanted his wisdom. I wanted his insight. He gave it mid-semester when it was time to workshop my first story. Before we begin today, he said, I'd like to make a few comments. This was new. He'd never prefaced a story before. A smile crept on my face as I allowed myself to imagine him praising me for my depiction of a den of heroin addicts for this was not easy to do, requiring, among other things, an intimate knowledge of heroin addicts and a certain flair for profanity. Are you all familiar with gangster rap? McPherson asked. We were, despite the fact that besides me, all the students were white and mostly middle to upper class. While we each nodded our familiarity with the genre, McPherson reached into a shopping bag he brought and removed the magazine. He opened it to a pre-marked page on which was a picture of a rapper cloaked in jewelry and guns and leaning against the hood of a squad car. 
Behind him was a sprawling slum. This person raps about the ghetto, McPherson said, but he doesn't live in the ghetto. He lives in a wealthy white suburb with his wife and daughter. His daughter attends a predominantly white private school. That's what this article is about. He closed the magazine and returned it to the bag. What some gangster rappers are doing, he continued, is using black stereotypes because white people eat that stuff up. But these images are false. They're dishonest. Some rappers are selling out their race for personal gain. He paused again, this time to hold up my story. That's what this writer is doing with his work. He set my story back on the table. Okay, that's all I have to say. You can discuss it now. For a few seconds, the only sound in the room was of my labored breathing. And then someone said, McPherson's right. The story is garbage. Complete rubbish, said another. And so it went from there. I did not sleep that night. At 8 a.m. when I could hold out no longer, I called McPherson at home and demanded a conference. He agreed to meet me in his office in 10 minutes. He was there when I arrived, sitting behind his desk. The desk was bare except for a copy of my story, and the office was bare except for the desk and two chairs. The built-in bookshelves held nothing, and nothing hung on the walls. There was no dressing on the windows, no telephone, and no computer. It might have been the janitor's office, a place to catch a few winks while the mop floors dried and McPherson might have been the janitor. His blue shirt was a mass of wrinkles and his eyes were bloodshot. His trademark hat seemed to rest at an odd angle on his head. From beneath it, a single long braid had worked its way free and dangled rebelliously behind his right ear. He noticed me staring at it and poked it back into concealment. Are you okay? He asked. His voice was gentle, full of concern. You sounded like a crazy man on the phone. Well, I'm not a crazy man, I said. I reached forward to tap my finger on my story and proceeded to rant and rave as only a crazy man could. I did not make this stuff up, I insisted. I'm from the ghetto. I went through the characters one by one, citing various relatives on whom they were based. And I mentioned that just the week before, my younger brother had been shot in the back while in McDonald's. I told him I had another brother who was in and out of prison, a heroin addict sister-in-law, that I had once been arrested for car theft, falsely, but that was besides the point, and that many, many of my friends were still living in the miserable community in which I had been raised. You misread my story, I said in conclusion and you misread me. I leaned back and folded my arms across my chest, waiting for his apology. Instead, I watched as he sprang from his chair and hurried from the room. He turned left into the hall and a moment later he passed going right with Frank Conroy calling after him. And then they passed left again, now with Connie Brothers, the program's administrator in tow. And after two more passes, this awful parade came to an end somewhere out of view. Now Connie stood before me, looking as nauseous as I felt. Jim is the kindest soul on earth, she said quietly. Why? Why would you insult him? For an instant, I saw myself at 12, looking at a closed front door behind which was my first love, who had just dumped me and left me standing on her porch trying, unsuccessfully, not to cry. Connie magically produced a tissue and handed it to me. She rubbed my shoulders while I rambled incoherently, something about sleep deprivation and McPherson being my father. It's okay, sweetie, Connie said. I'll talk to him.
McPherson returned momentarily. I apologized. He told me it was okay that workshops can make people uptight and sensitive. It had been difficult for him too, he explained, when he was a student there in the 70s. There was a lull in the conversation before he asked, so where are your people from? He still does not believe me, I thought. I mumbled, Chicago. No, no, that's where they are. Where are they from? Oh, sorry, Arkansas. Mine are from Georgia, he said. He smiled and added, that place is a motherfucker. The essence of Black America was conveyed in that response. A toughness of spirit, humor laced with tragedy. But at that moment, all I saw was the man who had rejected my vision. Defeated, I thanked him for agreeing to meet with me as I rose to leave. He stood and shook my hand. As I was walking out the door, he called my name. I turned to face him. Stereotypes are valuable, he said, but only if you use them to your advantage. They present your readers with something they'll recognize, and it pulls them into what appears to be familiar territory, a comfort zone. But once they're in, you have to move them beyond the stereotype. You have to show them what's real. What's real, I asked. Without hesitation, he said, you. It was one of those things that you instantly recognize as profound, and then, because you don't quite understand it, try to forget as quickly as you can. It was also one of those things that you cannot forget. And so it roamed freely in my subconscious, occasionally coming into sharp focus to remind me of its presence. But I allowed myself to be consumed by it no more than I would a housefly for about a year. And then I went to see him again. I was wondering, I said, if you wouldn't mind supervising an independent project. Well, that depends, he responded, on what you'd like to study. Me, I said, I want to study me. We started with Black folklore and history. Next, we moved on to blues and jazz, and then we covered a broad range of Black literature and culture. We studied Black intellectuals and philosophers, sociologists, anthropologists, activists, filmmakers, and ex-cons. For four years, we dissected nearly every aspect of Black life and thought. And in the process, a theme emerged that had been there all along. Life is a motherfucker. Living it anyway, and sometimes laughing in the process, is where humanity is won. And this is what I learned about me. I had become my own stereotype, a character in one of my short stories who insisted on seeing himself primarily as a repository of pain and defeat, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. The very people with whom I had been raised and had dedicated myself to rendering in prose had become victims of my myopia. My story showed people being affected by drug addiction, racism, poverty, murder, crime, violence, but they said nothing about the spirit that, despite being confronted, with what often amounted to certain defeat, would continue to struggle and aspire for something better. That old slave song, We Shall Overcome, pretty much says it all. The coursework I conducted with McPherson ultimately contributed to a doctorate in interdisciplinary studies. McPherson served as my dissertation chair I knew when I started my academic career that I owed him a debt to teach Black literature in a certain way. Less time needs to be spent on the dragons, he told me once, and more on our ability to forge swords for battle and the skill with which we've used them. The man at the Christmas party, of course, would rather that I talk about the dragons. And at first, when students take my class, they are surprised, even a bit disappointed, to see that the course will not head in that direction. 
but by the end of the semester, they are invariably uplifted by the heroic nature of African-Americans, in part, perhaps, because it is the nature found in us all. Sometimes students thank me for this approach. On occasion, they ask me where I got the idea. I tell them I got it from my father. So that is my essay about James Allen McPherson. The book, as I mentioned, is dedicated to James Allen McPherson. I have tried to honor him in his philosophy of writing and purpose with every essay in the book. Uh, I'll mention one of the essays uh, briefly before Mina returns and we can have a chat. Uh, one of the essays in the book is called Breathe. And it's about my son who is having seizures when he's 12 years old. And we find ourselves embroiled in a medical system that is um, at times hostile to African-Americans. Uh, the story on its surface is in fact a critique of the medical system and the racism embedded in it. But beneath that level, it is a story about a father and a son and a father who finds himself helpless in his attempt, in his attempt to protect his son from harm. You don't have to be a black person to relate to that. You simply have to be a human who knows what it means to love someone and be desperate to protect them. All of the essays in the book, I hope, reach readers on the human level so that everyone can relate to these stories and see themselves on the page. Now I'll be happy to talk about it and answer your questions. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you, Gerald. Um, that particular essay that you just read um, about Mc, uh, Professor McPherson just made me cry when I read the book because I felt like it opened my eyes in such a way that, it, that they'd never look, you know, been opened before. So thank you. Um, I have a couple other thank yous. One is that I agree that libraries can save and change lives. Thank you so much for your comment, commenting about that. And I worked at a community college library for a little while. So I know that they also can change lives for a lot of people. And um, we had somebody in the chat also comment on, on that as well. So um, we appreciate your, um, <laughs> your uplifting us as you uplift, we uplift, you know, like we uplift each other. Um, so I've, I'm just gonna start the, with this question. Um, and I think Leslie has something really interesting, um, a similar question to it. Um, are you fearful when you're writing, fearful of emotions, of exposing yourself and your family? How do you get through that fear? Uh, there's a lot of fear involved in writing, um, especially personal essays and essays that um, by their very nature involve the people who are close to you. Uh, so I, I, I am fearful of doing unintentional harm to people. When you are a personal essayist or a memoir, you sign up to expose yourself on the page. That is in fact your responsibility. The people with whom you live, the people whom you love made no such uh, decision to be on those pages. So you have to um, tread very carefully and um, do what you can to not do harm to people who don't deserve it. So I'm careful about the stories I tell. I'm careful about how I handle my loved ones uh, on the page and even my colleagues and friends. Uh, I, if there's something, if I'm writing an essay or a story that is important to me to convey a certain point, but it comes at a cost of someone who doesn't deserve it, then I don't write that essay. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, that uh, went along with a question that I have about how do you create like a really full picture of, of your experience as a memoirist when you have to leave so much on the cutting room floor? Well, um, as it turns out, as I mentioned, uh, when I gave the preface of who I am, uh, I can leave a lot in the cutting room floor, but there's plenty remaining <laughs> for me to make use of. I mean, my life has been kind of nuts in many ways. And that's one reason why I switched from fiction to nonfiction, uh, because mm -hmm. I didn't have to fabricate these stories. Uh, the stories are uh, things that I lived. So I have plenty to say uh, without needing to um, use controversial material in a way uh, that harms people. Now, this isn't to say that I don't sometimes decide that the story is the more important thing. 
And sometimes you can write a story that you fully believe causes no one harm. And yet you'll get an email from a friend or a phone call or a text, and they will be enraged that you portrayed them in a certain way or revealed something about them that they didn't want revealed. So even when you are as careful as you can possibly be, uh, sometimes you inevitably um, can cause people anxiety when they see themselves on the page and they don't approve of what they see. Mm -hmm. You just can't, um, you can't predict, you can't always have that crystal ball right. and how people will respond. So Susan has this question and, and I'd like to read the whole thing if you don't mind. Sure. Um, thank you, this was mesmerizing. I recently attended a lecture on microaggressions you said that it is critical that we understand the huge percentage of American history that was characterized by slavery and then Jim Crow and now prison, the prison pipeline. I was troubled. Doesn't that just make people feel like victims instead of feeling empowered? Your approach makes more sense to me, but I suspect that this is a huge controversy now in academia. Please comment. Well, it's an extraordinary controversy in academia. And one of the essays uh, I wrote in the piece uh, addresses this point directly. Um, I went to a faculty meeting one day and students stormed the room and took over the meeting, they hijacked it. And they wanted to complain about the microaggressions that they had been victim of while being students at Emerson College. And they were very, very upset about it. And I, uh, in the audience, was disappointed in them because when they were making their complaints about things such as uh, people wanting to touch their hair and asking if they were there because of affirmative action. And all of these things, all these microaggressions that they experience on a daily basis had so rocked so many of them that they were in tears as they told these stories. And I could not help but think of my experiences as someone their age being physically assaulted by white police officers and going through what I thought were some pretty serious hardships and so I had a, it was difficult for me to, uh, to adjust my sympathies to the point where I could care as much as the students cared about their microaggressions. Um, I changed my tune on that uh, in the course of writing the essay because you have to put these things in context and allow students to feel the difficulties that they feel and believe that they are real because they are real to them. And all of this stuff is, is relative. But rather than focusing on a lot of the uh, microaggressions, uh, I still prefer as a writer and even as a human making his way through the world, prefer to dwell on the micro defenses, the way that we as African-Americans have devised to deflect and shield ourselves from these daily slights so that they don't do us any kind of lasting harm. And in fact, if you approach them as I try to approach them, uh, they can become uh, humorous in some way and downright silly because ultimately these microaggressions, while they are wrong and shouldn't happen, are uh, nothing compared to what our ancestors had to go through in order for us to be at these elite schools experiencing these microaggressions. Mm -hmm. Kind of makes me think of um, Harry Potter in the, that spell the, with the Bogart, you know, where they 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 would see it as a ridiculous thing and they're able to uh go past their fear um sorry <laughs> harry potter hit in the that's brain. right i, I have, um, to, have two sons who were raised in harry potter so know exactly what you're talking about <laughs> i'll have to talk to them someday about it in fact the next question is how do your children feel about your writing oh that's a really great question um when i wrote my first book street shadows which was about my teenage delinquency um I didn't want them to read it. I was, <laughs> I was kind of worried about it. They were pretty young at the time, but as they became 10, 11 years old, I thought, mm, right now they think daddy is just kind of a goofy clown. Um, I don't know if they want them for, for them to see that daddy wasn't always a... You know. So I would hide the books. Um, and then when I thought they were old enough to handle the material and that perhaps we could talk about it, uh, I gave them the books. They were in their early teens. And they said, yeah, thanks, but no thanks, dad. We have no interest whatsoever in your life. <laughs> and they just didn't want to read it. They just didn't care because ultimately what teenager cares about their parents' life? They just don't care. My youngest son, who is now um, about to be 20 years old, surprised me two weeks ago. He said um, he's a student at Emerson College now, 
And he has a key to my office and he makes good use of it. <laughs> and in my office is a copy of Street Shadows. And he called home one day and said, um, I see your book is here in the shelf. And I thought, if you don't mind, I'd read it. And I said, oh, okay. And so uh, he read it and he called me and said, that was fantastic. I loved it. You went through a lot of stuff. I had no idea that that was what your life was like, but wow, what an experience and I'm proud of you. And that was a nice moment for me. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, they, it, some of my stuff, um, I, I worry about my kids reading, but ultimately um, I have faith in, in them as readers and as uh, my children who know me for who I, who I am. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's amazing. I will look forward to the day that my kids think I've done something great. <laughs> um, so Joanne says, I'm curious when you found out about from that admissions person at the university, you would not be accepted. Did she tell you about community colleges or did you discover them on your own? He did not tell me at all. Uh, I am convinced that he had uh, no hope for me whatsoever. And I mean, why should he? I guess he should have. Maybe he should have. But um, I mean, I, I mean, it was kind of a ridiculous thing for me to arrive and say, I'd like, yeah, I'd like to take that class, that class, and that class. And by the way, I never finished high school. Uh, he did not mention a community college. I simply, uh, it took me maybe just a couple of weeks to do research to see if there was some other place where I could go. And when I found my community college and discovered that they wanted nothing, I had a GED, I'd gotten my GED by then. Uh, but that's all that they needed. They didn't care. I simply had to uh, pay my very reasonable tuition and start taking classes. And so I did. And my experience at Harold Washington Community College remains the best ac academic experience I've had in my life. Thank you. Again, as a, somebody who worked at a, a community college, I know that there are pipelines to people's future. So yeah. I really appreciate that. Um, so when you speak about resilience, in your book, which again was so um, just eye-opening to me about that perspective. Um, how can we learn more about the uh, resilience of the black history um, you know, through, through this lens that you've shown me? Because as we were talking about earlier before this started, publishers don't really wanna go in that direction. How can we find this? Well, that, that is the thing. We, um, we had a nice chat before we went live um, publishers are uh, not risk takers. And if they believe that a certain type of narrative will make money, they don't like to venture from it. And so uh, my book, How to Make a Slave, which is uh, more uh, positive and does speak of resilience and um, it affirms black life and affirms humanity. Uh, publishers said no thanks. And in fact, I had over 20 rejections of the book before uh, someone finally decided to take a chance on it. Um, but it is possible to find uh, narratives like mine. They are much more available now. And, and I think publishers are recognizing that the black story is a story of variety and that while you cannot escape narratives of hardship because that is a part of black uh, experience, uh, you also, if you are faithful to what African Americans have been through in this country, you cannot escape stories of heroism and courage and bravery. And so um, these narratives uh, are out there and they're, they're, they're more and more common. We'll be looking for them because I do love that perspective. Um, John asks, what do you make of controversies over critical race theory and divisive concepts being taught in schools? I can't, I can't for the life of me understand <laughs> what this is about. I mean, I, I, I understand uh, that there's an impulse for people to not have their students see a part of history that might make them uncomfortable and perhaps might make them guilt-ridden. But they need not feel that if the literature they look at is taught in a way that I mentioned that I teach my literature that while I talk about how people were, African-Americans were in fact enslaved, uh, they also resisted that slavery. They also fought against it. They devised many survival strategies to endure it. If anything, the children who are learning this history ought to feel proud that they share this planet, this space with the people 
who have managed to rise from this brutality and to prove to the world that they were more than the sum of it, that they in fact are people worth celebrating. You don't have to feel bad reading about black history. You can in fact recognize the atrocities, but you don't have to adopt them as something that is always front of mind when you see an African-American. You don't have to say, oh, here comes an oppressed guy into my store. No, you can say, here comes a heroic figure into my store. Here is someone who has overcome some things. It in fact reminds me in, in, in one way, I myself was um, someone who had to, as I mentioned in the essay about McPherson, had to overcome the belief that the negative narrative about blacks was the, um, the primary one. And it simply isn't true. And I learned this lesson before I met McPherson in a very personal way uh, from my wife. When I um, met her, I just started writing my short stories. This was almost 30 years ago now. And um, she was reading my stories. And she asked me one day, why do you write fiction instead of nonfiction? And I said, well, I'm kind of ashamed of some of the stuff I did. Yeah, I did some bad things. And I, and she said, but look how you came out of it. Look at you now. Look how you've overcome it. These are not stories of shame. These are stories of triumph. And you ought to celebrate them so that people like you or people who aspire to be like you can have a model that they can study. And so from her advice, uh, I switched from fiction to nonfiction and I stepped from behind the mask and um, revealed myself to be someone who's human, has flaws, uh, but also has uh, many redemptive qualities that are worth being um, celebrated. That is a spouse to stay with. <laughs> I've done it for quite some time to, uh, to, to my uh, amazement that she has stuck around. <laughs> <laughs> Got nothing on that. Okay. Yeah, let's, let's so, move on. Let's yeah, move let's on. Go, let's go. We'll just cut that right out of the discussion. <laughs> um, Brita says, in Breathe, and I think elsewhere in the book, you mentioned your regrets about settling in a small white town instead of in Boston. Boston has a reputation for being a pretty racist place. How have your feelings about the suburbs versus the city evolved over time? Well, um, when I said that in the essay, it was, I, it was an irrational thought. It was me thinking, well, if we weren't here, it would be better if we were over there. But over there has got problems too. Mm -hmm. So I recognize that. But I do know that living in small communities that have small clinics uh, where if your minority population of your town is 1%, odds are when you walk through the door in the ER, you're gonna be the first black people, black person many people have seen um, as a patient. And they may be bearing some biases and stereotypes, which is what happened to uh, me and my son. And so at least in an urban setting, you have people who have had um, encounters with people from different backgrounds and cultures and um, are not going to uh, resort to whatever stereotypes they believe about people because they've had an opportunity to get beyond those. Interesting. Um, Leticia asks, and I know not all authors like to talk about other authors, so you don't have to <laughs> completely answer this, but do you think Toni Morrison is a writer who focuses on resilience in addition to hardships? Um, yes, I think she does. Uh, but it is also in the eye of the beholder. If you want to go to Toni Morrison to um, have a reason to um, wallow in self-pity, uh, you will find it. But you will also find uh, reasons to celebrate Black life and culture um, and courage in her work as well. So she's not a she's not a, um, a you know one trick pony in that regard. She covers the full breadth of the black experience, um, the negative, the positive, the victimology, and also the survivalist. Um, she's got everything. Absolutely. Um, Jim asks, you describe some amazing experiences with teachers and mentors early in your writing journey. Now that the script has switched, how has your teaching experience been? I, I don't do this anymore, but what I used to do when I first started teaching uh, was to invoke Professor Homewood's name in all of my classes. Uh, because Professor Homewood used to, used to 
<laughs> it was a funny when I had my first classes with him at the end of the semester, um, he would break down in tears and just start bawling on the final day of class. And he would say to us, I mean, I'm sorry, I can't help it, but every end of the semester to me, it's like all of my close friends dying. That's what he was, he was, he was a pretty dramatic guy. I know he was pretty dramatic. And I thought to myself, this man's nuts. He's insane. 20 years later, when I taught my first class and it came to an end and I was saying goodbye, I broke down in tears and I was bawling. And I understood what Professor Homewood meant. And so what I um, did in those days was to tell my students the story about Professor Homewood believing that people were dying when they were leaving for the last day, was to tell my students that I didn't want them to die on me. And that the end of the semester did not have to be the end of our relationship. For that as long as I am on this planet, I will always be their professor, I'm their professor for life. And so if they ever have any work that they would like me to see or read, to send it to me at any time. And to this day, I've been teaching now for about 25 years, I still have students send me work and ask for feedback. And I, and I give it because I owe that to Professor Homewood. I wanna tell one more story about Professor Homewood since, since he's on, the, on our minds. Um, after I published my first book, uh, Street Shadows, uh, I, with great pride, um, called him to say, I just got my first copies. I'm mailing you a copy right now and I'm gonna be in Chicago to start my book tour and I would like for you to be at my reading. He said, I'll be happy to attend your reading, but I have some sad news for you. I have macular degeneration and I can't read anymore. Oh my gosh. I will, not, I will not be able to read your book. And I was devastated because that book would not have existed without him. Mm -hmm. But I sent him a copy anyway. And I went to Chicago on the day of my reading and I waited for him outside of the reading room. I waited in the lobby near the elevator and the door opened at some point and he came out with his hand on someone's shoulder who I thought perhaps was a friend, but it was a stranger who was simply helping him to the reading room because Professor Homewood couldn't see. And as he neared me, he said, Professor Homewood, it's me, it's Jerry. And he took his hands off the man's shoulders and he put them on mine. And he said, Jerry, my dear boy, I did it. I managed to read every word of your book and how fitting it is that yours is the last I'll ever read. And uh, we embraced, I took him into the reading room I placed him in the seat I had reserved for him in the front row. And before I started the reading, I had him stand and told everyone in the room what he meant to me and how they are here with us now because of this man. So I know we can't see people in the, uh, the attendees, but I think I just heard a huge wail go up <laughs> from everybody just, that is just incredibly touching. And um, it just says so much about him and how much he cared for you. And, and not just me. Um, I found out I'm not so special after all. I wasn't with him because he, he, this is how he treated his students. He was dedicated to seeing uh, people get the most out of their talents and their abilities and out of life. That was why he chose a community college. And he was in that room waiting for me and the other me's who would come through completely lost, having no idea what they want to do with themselves and owning, only needing guidance uh, and someone to believe in them. And, and um, he is one of many, many people that I've encountered like that who have passed me to the next person and the next person and the next person uh, who have helped me get to where I am. <laughs> I'm gonna just take a second. So we're all just about out of time, but I did want to say that I read when I was prepping for this uh, talk that uh, Professor McPherson passed away in 2016. Yeah. I'm wondering, um, of course, that must have been devastating, but I'm wondering how his loss affected you and your writing. Um, I was crushed by his passing. I dedicated the book to his memory, so he never got to read this. Uh, he never saw it.
Uh, he did not know of my uh, success. I mean, I published the two books prior to it. He did read those. Those books were okay. I Well, I think they're outstanding, but the literary world didn't agree necessarily. So I think they're good books. They're fine books, but they did not um, achieve the critical acclaim of how to make a slave. And I, I wish that he had lived to see how his mentorship of me has resulted in me producing work that pays him honor. Uh, his daughter did contact me when she heard about the book and she expressed to me her gratitude and her pride and she assured me that her father would have been tremendously proud of me and that he had spoken of me often. So that was that was quite nice. Yeah, um, and depending on your beliefs, he knows. He knows how wonderful this book is. Um, so just as a last quick question, um, people would like to know, what do you read, um, fiction and nonfiction? Who are your favorite authors to go to when you're not writing? Um, I live on uh, Ralph Ellison. Uh, James Allen McPherson was a student of Ralph Ellison. And um, one of the first people McPherson directed me to was Ralph Ellison, so I, I read him. Charles Johnson, these are people from uh, way back, but these are the people who formed my, um, my thinking. Um, Stanley Crouch is another one of my favorite writers. I love Toni Morrison um, as well. And a lot of people now, contemporary uh, writers like Kiese Lehman is pretty outstanding. Um, I got a chance to meet him briefly, which is pretty great. And um, yeah, I and I try to read um, anthologies so I can see who's who. So I read the best American essays and pushcart prizes and um, a lot more probably fiction than nonfiction uh, these days. And during the semester, I read a lot of student work <laughs> and that's, that's pretty much my job, but that's also a, re a reward because I have some pretty uh, outstanding writers. Oh, I'm sure the next the next generation. Um, so what is up for next for you? What can we look forward to from you? Uh, I am um, about midway through another collection of essays, mm -hmm. uh, a follow up to how to make a slave, although these essays will um, broaden a bit more from being personal to um, commenting more on events that are uh, in the news. So if it's if it's happening, uh, I'm going to weigh in on it mm -hmm. and uh, have some commentary about things that are happening in society. I found myself writing a whole lot more about Trump than I wanted to, mm -hmm. um, but um, he's got to be he's got to be addressed, and I'm going to do it. <laughs> well, I'll look forward to that just to get your perspective, because it's always such a, a full perspective. It's not uh, narrow, which I really appreciate. So I would like to thank you for, for giving us your time and all of this amazing content for us to think about and dwell on and, and read about. I, um, I think, you know, people in the audience, feel free to, you know, write in the chat what you thought about the program, to giving um, Gerald your thanks for, for being here, just as I am. Um, I would like to, again, thank the libraries that have um, helped bring this program together, um, Brookline, Newton, Tewksbury, Waltham, and Watertown, as well as the State Library of Massachusetts, which, as I said earlier today, is just one of your huge fans. Um, and, of course, the Friends of the Ac um, Ashland Library and area. So um, you can get Gerald's books from the bookstore or from the library, but please read them because they're just wonderful and um, there is so important, I'll say that. So thank you again, Gerald, for being here. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you, Mina. Thank you everyone for tuning in. I really, really had a great time. Thank you. Awesome. Have a good night, everybody.